So imagine this, it's the 1970s and you're an engineer at NASA. Not just any engineer, you're a literal rocket scientist. Rocket power is the key to greater accomplishments in space. Designing the next generation of high performance rocket engines. The stuff you're working on now will eventually go into the space shuttle, except you need to make something that is impossible to manufacture with traditional tools. If the year was 2023, you could just 3D print it out of metal. But that's not an option because it's the 70s. And metal 3D printing doesn't exist yet. And so it's time to break out your secret weapon, wax. Yeah, seriously. I mean, they used a fancy wax, but essentially it's candle wax. And it was absolutely critical to manufacturing the most important part of the space shuttle's engine the main combustion chamber. I've been in love with this technique ever since I first heard about it. So I decided to make my own scale model of the main combustion chamber to demonstrate how the technique works. First, we probably need a quick crash course on rocket chamber layout and how it all works. I am definitely not a rocket scientist, so this is just a very high level overview so that we're all on the same page. Most people are probably familiar with the large bell shape at the bottom of a rocket engine. It's the most iconic and noticeable part of any rocket. What we're talking about today is directly above the bell. The section up here is known as the main combustion chamber, and it's where all the combustion originally takes place. Through combustion in the thrust chamber, great amounts of energy are released. It's not dissimilar from the combustion chamber inside of a car engine. We're mixing together fuel and oxidizer and igniting it to create some type of force which we use. Hot expanding gas escapes through the nozzle throat. Unlike a car engine, the temperatures and pressures inside of this main combustion chamber are truly staggering. We're talking about upwards of 3,500 degrees Celsius and pressures in excess of 6,000 pounds. So if you'd like to keep your combustion chamber from just melting into a pool of metal, you need some way to protect it or actively cool it. There are a lot of ways to do this, but the most common technique is called regenerative cooling, where you pump the fuel or the oxidizer through channels or tubes along the surface of the combustion chamber to draw the heat away from it and keep everything from melting. It's kind of like water cooling a PC, except you're using cryogenic liquid hydrogen instead. Everyday Astronaut has a really good video on this topic, exploring all the different ways to cool a rocket. So if you're interested in more details on that, check it out, the link's down in the description. So back in the early days of spaceflight, if you wanted to use regenerative cooling, you often brazed thin pipes along the exterior of your combustion chamber. And the pipes are what flowed the coolant throughout the system to extract the heat. This is the method used on the F1 engine on the Saturn V rockets. And you can see the tubes running up and down the nozzle here, and they extend up into the main combustion chamber. The fuel is rooted through the many tubes which stack together. In this manner, the fuel cools the chamber and protects it from the high combustion gas temperatures within. But this technique does have some issues. It's relatively heavy because you have all of these thousands of extra steel pipes that you need to bond onto the engine, adding a whole lot of extra mass. The brazing process generates thousands of joints that need to be inspected to make sure that all of them are absolutely perfect. And it's just not thermodynamically all that ideal. You've got the heat which needs to transfer through the chamber wall and then through the pipe wall before it can get to the coolant. Ideally, we would have those coolant channels built directly into the chamber itself so that it's all one monolithic piece. It'd be a simpler system, lighter, and cool better. It's like a win-win-win. Unfortunately, it's also impossible to machine conventionally. The machines used by the machinist are called machine tools. Internal cooling channels that conform to the shape of the chamber are impossible to drill out with straight drills. And bent drills just don't really work that well for some reason. So NASA and their contractors came up with a pretty brilliant solution to this problem and did it using a technique that's kind of like the original additive manufacturing before 3D printing was ever a thing. So let's machine a replica of the combustion chamber and then I'll walk through the process about how this works. This is a moderately faithful replica of the main combustion channel of the RS-25 engine, 
the engine used on the space shuttle. It's made out of copper, like the original MCC, but there are some differences. I machined mine out of a single piece of copper, but <laughs> that wouldn't have been remotely possible for the space shuttle. Just given the size of the engines, it would have been prohibitively expensive to machine it out of a single piece. Instead, they used a vacuum melting and centrifugal casting technique to get the raw casting, which was then later machined to the final dimensions. The shuttle also used a special copper alloy known as Narloy Z, a copper-silver-zirconium mix. Copper is used because it transfers heat so well, but pure copper is not really strong enough to be used in the main combustion chamber, so Narloy Z was developed to provide a stronger alloy. The silver and zirconium help strengthen the copper and make it withstand the forces involved. After the chamber takes on its characteristic hourglass shape, thin slots were machined along the exterior of the chamber. These are the coolant slots that will allow liquid hydrogen to flow up and down it and pull that heat away. But right now these are just slots and we need enclosed channels. So the next process is known as the closeout, where we form an outer layer or jacket on top of the inner copper core. This is a two-step process, and the first step is where we use our secret weapon, wax. A rigid, machinable wax is melted into the channels and then carefully scraped and sanded off by hand. The purpose of this is to fill up all the channels and make a smooth, continuous profile along the exterior of the chamber. I used jeweler's wax, which is a very similar type as to what they used. It's hard and machinable, and it's not gummy like a beeswax would be. It ended up being very challenging to work at this scale because the wax doesn't really adhere well to metal, and the slots are so thin that there's just not a lot of material for it to grip onto. So I spent approximately my entire life melting wax into these channels, carefully filing, sanding, scraping it out, then going back to fix all the points where the wax had dislodged itself and I needed to refill a channel. So it was very tedious, but I eventually got a completely covered surface that we could move on to the next step with. I did also try using super glue, which was thickened with either fume silica or graphite, and that did an okay job. It certainly bonds the metal better, but extracting it at the end proved awfully challenging. So the wax ended up being the best method. After the slots are finished being filled, the next step is to create the outer jacket using electroplating. If you're not familiar with electroplating, I have an older video where I used it to strengthen 3D prints, and it does a pretty good job explaining it from a technical perspective. But from a high level, you can think of electroplating as a special solution that contains metal ions, and when you apply an electric current, the ions come out of the solution and deposit onto the thing you're trying to electroplate forming essentially a small, thin layer of metal. There are a handful of different metals this works with, but the main ones that are used are copper and nickel. Copper is typically used because it's fairly conductive, and it also plates really easily, so it can be used as a base layer. And nickel is a relatively stiff and strong metal, so it's good for durability purposes. NASA used a very thin layer of copper first, followed by a very thick layer of nickel on top. The copper acts as a shield to prevent hydrogen embrittlement of the nickel and steel layers on the outside. The liquid hydrogen flowing through these channels will embrittle nickel and steel over time, causing them to be structurally unsound, and you don't really want that in a rocket engine. So the copper acts as a little shielding layer to prevent the hydrogen from escaping. The nickel layer that's put on top is the main structural layer, and they plated it pretty thickly to provide enough strength for the chamber. So I dropped my model into a copper electroplating bath and let a thin layer of copper form across the surface. You can see it spreading across the wax here. Ah, but wait, if you're at all familiar with electroplating, you know that plating only works on conductive surfaces and wax most definitely is not conductive. So how is this working? Best I can tell, NASA buffed a fine silver powder onto the surface of the wax, which made the wax conductive. This technique is also used on other engines, like the Vulcan on the Ariane 5, and I saw in a documentary that their wax was black, which I'm not positive, but I'm assuming that means it's filled with graphite to make it conductive. So I followed that technique and doped my wax with a whole bunch of graphite powder until it was reasonably conductive. It has just enough conductivity to allow the copper to spread across the surface, and once you have a thin layer, it doesn't matter anymore, and it just builds up from there. I let this plate for a couple hours, pulled it out, rinsed it off, and put it in the nickel electroplating bath next. This takes 
a very long time. <laughs> so NASA plated a centimeter or two of nickel onto the surface of their chamber, and most plating baths deposit somewhere between 20 and 30 micrometers per hour. So you can imagine how long it takes to build up a centimeter of material. I plated mine for 24 hours, then pulled it out and machined off the surface to see how much more was needed to fill in all the gaps and realized we had quite a bit of work to do. So I repeated the process a few more times, totaling I think about 72 hours in the plating bath. And you can still see that even at the end of it, we don't have a very uniform surface. <laughs> but although it's a little ugly, it did close out the surface and I think we can proceed to the final step, which is removing the wax from the channels. When I started on this project, I originally assumed NASA just melted the wax out because that seems the most logical thing. But in actuality, I found a paper saying that they dissolved it with perchloroethylene, which kind of makes sense. You want to make sure all the wax gets out without leaving any type of like carbon residue from a burning or melting process. Despite that, I tried melting at first because it seemed like the easiest thing to do at my scale with this little replica. And it sort of worked, but it didn't clear all the wax. So I also ended up trying to dissolve it out chemically using xylene and hot oil, like canola oil. But eventually I got the channels cleared and we can see the final result. It's definitely not as polished or professional looking as what NASA could produce. It's a little ugly, but <laughs> honestly, I am, I'm really excited that this worked at all. Like, it's really cool to see that nickel layer on the outside bonded to the copper with just a hollow channel in between. I think I ended up depositing about 500 microns of nickel, and I machined that back to roughly 300 microns all the way around. It's cool to think that this is exactly the same process as used by NASA and Rocketdyne to make the RS-25 engine. Just, you know, scaled up much larger and controlled in a much better manner. It's really just such a clever and ingenious method when you think about it. Engineers were able to fabricate a monolithic combustion chamber with internal conformal cooling channels at a time before 3D printing ever existed. It's just, it's so cool. I had some leftover material that I wasn't really gonna use for anything, so I decided to just machine up a few more of these chambers. They're not really useful for anything, but they make a cool little desktop widget or maybe a gift for a fellow space nerd. I only made a handful, but if that sounds like something you might wanna buy, there's a link down below. This technique is not without its downsides. As I mentioned, it's pretty slow and it requires a lot of handwork by humans to scrape and polish and sand everything. Electroplated metals can have a pretty significant amount of tensile or compressive stress depending on the composition of the bath. And in one of my early attempts, you can see that I didn't plate the nickel thick enough and the internal stress of the plating actually made it come unattached from the copper core. The new SLS rocket, which recently had its maiden flight, is also using the RS-25 engine, just like shuttle. But Rocketdyne has modernized a few of the features of the engine, including the main combustion chamber. Instead of using this sort of tedious electroplating process, they're now using something known as hot isostatic pressing. This uses intense heat and pressure to bond a prefabricated outer jacket to the copper core. This is much faster and much less human handholding to get the process done, and it also generates a stronger component. So it's all around just a better technique. Even though NASA has moved on from melting wax and electroplating, it has a special place in my heart because it's just such a great example of clever problem solving to work around manufacturing constraints. And I think ultimately that's what I love about manufacturing. It's usually an accumulation of small little tips and tricks and creative problem solving to build the thing that you're trying to build. And once you know a tool or a technique, it's in your toolbox forever. You can use it on future projects. I was recently doing something where I electroplated diamond onto custom ground tools for a glass machining project that I'm working on. If that sounds interesting to you, I published a video about it on Nebula. Nebula is a streaming platform created and owned by content creators. And it's a place where we can publish what we want without having to please an algorithm. This diamond electroplating project is a perfect example. I've been sitting on this footage for honestly ages. So this is my super janky quick setup to see if this idea would work. It was a little strange for me to be milling carbide. The next step is to electroplate this with our nickel diamond slurry. And then we pop it in the CNC and hit the go button. And I just couldn't bring myself to edit together a video about it because it's too small and too niche to really do well on YouTube, just given kind of the constraints of the platform. Time spent editing 
that video together could have been better spent on a project with wider appeal. And I don't have a team, it's just me, so I have to be careful about what I choose to spend my time on for YouTube. But now that I've joined Nebula, I actually have a reason to publish these videos. I mean, it's still a small and niche topic, like that's not going to change. But the folks watching it on Nebula help support the channel more than ads on YouTube ever would, given the size of the project. And of course, there are tons of other creators on Nebula. Practical Engineering, Real Engineering, Strange Parts, Bobby Broccoli, Wendover, like the list goes on. I know you'll probably like them because I watch all these channels myself. Nebula has no ads. Many creators publish exclusive content to Nebula, and there's a host of other features like classes and newsletters and podcasts. Cereal is better without milk. If that sounds interesting, there's a link down below. It helps support me directly and gets you a pretty good discount. I think it's like 40% off, and if you sign up for the annual plan, it's just $2.50 a month. I'm still working on lots of cool stuff for this channel on YouTube, and I'm pretty excited for some of the projects that are coming out in the future. So I think that's all I got for you. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.